We're glad you can join us. We're above 70 participants right now. Thank you so much. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our facilitator for the evening, Ms. Michelle Hughes. Thank you, Craig. I'll just turn it right on over to Mr. Chambers. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Craig, if you could put us back on screen. I don't need to look at my name on this on the screen. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, well, we we uh, obviously appreciate everyone. If you're staff member or community members and parents, uh, a couple things about tonight's. Uh, presentations that I want to put into context for you. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna hear, and you're gonna see a lot of information related to our existing facilities. And for those that are familiar with the school district, some of this is not going to be new news, um, but it is going to be in depth. And part of the the purpose of this, it, well, not part of it, uh, the, the the majority of the reason for this is so that. Uh, you can get a feel for the way in which we have attempted to prevent bad things from happening to our facilities, the maintenance that we provide up front, uh, but also uh, to let you know where there are needs that are going to have to be addressed in this in, in this current uh, bond per, uh, referendum, and then kind of where we've been. But there's also going to be a part of this conversation about uh, our, our existing facilities and is it, and this is going to be a question for you as committee members, is it time for some of our existing facilities, I, schools in particular, is it time for us to begin looking at either major renovations, uh, bulldoze and start over and rebuild uh, a combination? And, and the reason, the reason we, we, we want to bring this to you as a, as a point of discussion is uh, we do have some schools that are getting older. And, and we have some campuses that have had uh, some issues over a period of time that, that uh, our maintenance, Jeff Delisle and his team and Glenn, uh, Jared and his team, they have continued to, to keep those schools uh, looking good, <laughs> looking real good. And so that to, the, to the outsider, it doesn't look like there's a lot wrong with it. Um, so we've, we've got some, some, some different, uh, in my opinion, we have some, some interesting conversations to be had not just tonight, but as we move forward, identifying through uh, Michelle's process about what do we want to include on this. Uh, but as you're listening to these presentations and as you're thinking through what you're hearing and what you're seeing, I, I, I want to remind you of something we shared with you last time, two weeks ago, is um, we, we, not only are we as a district looking at our facilities and not only are we asking you as committee members to look at our facilities, but we're also asking you to think into the future um, not only is it a facility conversation, but in many cases, it's a marketing and a, a conversation about how do we, how do we continually uh, provide the types of facilities, the looks, the appearances uh, that are appealing to families and that are appealing to parents and that are appealing to kids. And uh, while, while the building is a major part of the child's education, it's not the only part. There has to be substance within that building, but a building is important. And as every one of us, human nature, when we see new things happening, when we see construction, when we see things happening in an area, the first thing we think of is progress, regardless of what it is. And so please, as, as you listen tonight, just be thinking about what, are, uh, what types of facilities would we want for our own children? And, and I want to remind you that every one of you, both employees and community members, you are now, you are speaking and representing thousands and thousands of families in our community, thousands of parents who don't have this voice. Um, they, 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 they want the best for their children, just like you do, uh, but they don't, they, they don't have, they, they have not figured out how to have their voice heard. And so it's incumbent upon us to share that and, 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 uh, so as we look at these facilities, not only the, the, the maintenance that's been done on them and what we need to do in the future, but we're also gonna to talk to you about some built, some schools that we think we need to consider um, uh, renovating, major renovations, facelifts, not just facelifts, not cosmetic, but some significant, some significant improvements to them to not only be appealing to families and parents, but also to make it more in line with 21st instruction, 21st century instruction, so that our kids have access to the 
to the best and the most uh, uh, up-to-date uh, types of facilities that, that we possibly can provide for them, which is my goal for, for all of this. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and I'll turn it back over to Michelle and appreciate everyone's participation. But uh, as we go through this, please kind of keep those, that context in the back of your mind. Oh, 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 Michelle, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let me share something real quick. It deals with money and it's, this really doesn't have much to do with the bond reference uh, process, but it is relevant to our school district and it's, um, it's relevant to the community. Um, as you know, both when uh, the Trump administration was in, was in charge and then most recently with President Biden, uh, there have been three separate pieces of legislation passed that uh, was providing economic stimulus to states. There was one back in the summer, there was one in December, and there was one most recently in February uh, uh, after President Biden was uh, inaugurated. We, uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the house yesterday announced that uh, roughly 11, 11 and a half billion dollars of some of the federal money that's been allocated to Texas and public schools in Texas is being freed up to schools uh, immediately, basically. And uh, ALEAF is going to receive a significant portion of that because the money is based upon economically disadvantaged free and reduced lunch populations. So obviously we have a high economically disadvantaged population, so it stands to reason we're going to receive um, as a part of the, the, the student uh, uh, per, well, uh, per student funding portion of it, it's going to be pretty high. Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $160 million. Now, here's, the, here's how it relates to this. We cannot use that money for a lot of things that are reoccurring, uh, and we cannot supplant uh, using those funds for things that a bond referendum may, may, may uh, take, uh, take care of. However, there are some things that we will be talking to the district and to the board, and the reason I'm really hesitant to talk details because I haven't even shared, we, we haven't had conversations with the board on this, but I just want the committee to know if you saw that or heard that and you're just wondering how does that play into your responsibility or your role, it really doesn't have anything to do with it uh, in all honesty right now. Um, it, is a, it is a separate piece of money, a separate amount of money, significant, but it is primarily in place to help with the recovery of learning loss, the social emotional trauma that our children have gone through, uh, technology, you know, teacher training, planning, how do we work in a new, in a new environment going forward. So just want to kind of clear that up, but it was good news. Absolutely. It was good news. Uh, we had to fight for it, <laughs> fight to get the money, but nevertheless, we, we got it. And so uh, we're, our job is to work with the board and with others on how to use it in the best interest of our kids and our, in our district. So more to come on that. So with that, I will. Good news, Mr. Chambers. Thank you for sharing that. Ed, do you have something that you'd like to say to the committee? Yeah, so uh, first of all, happy Thursday, everybody. And hey, we'll take any kind of good news that, that involves a, a funding source of any kind. So uh, that's a great way to start off uh, start off this meeting. But, but again, I just want to welcome everyone again and thank you again for, uh, for taking out the time to be a part of this process. We know it's a significant uh, commitment and sacrifice, and we thank you for that. Uh, but I want you to know that you've made some major and significant contributions. You really, really have made some, some significant contributions to this process. So we want you to keep asking those tough questions and keep providing that valuable input. Uh, today, as uh, Superintendent Chambers mentioned, there's gonna be a lot of information to absorb. Uh, so we really do thank you for, uh, for carving out the time today and. Uh, Let's have a great, uh, great session this evening. And uh, again, thank you for, for participating. Thank you, Ed, so much. Uh, I'm going to, Pam, if it's okay for, with you, I'm going to skip our portion of this other than I just want to uh, reference the uh, slide number eight. And we don't have to even, well, you can put it up, Craig, but I just wanted you to keep in mind the decision-making model that we agreed upon at our first uh, couple of meetings, because that's going to be influencing considerably your decisions uh, that you start on May 13th and complete on June 10th meeting. So uh, we're, we'll just 
skip over those and, and move straight on into our presentations. Um, let me... Before we start our new presentations, I want to read just a very brief review of uh, fine arts and career in technology. So Renford, we'll start with you. Okay, can you hear me? Head nod, somebody? All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for the fine arts um, review, I'll be very brief. Uh, we had four main areas, our music programs, art programs, theater programs and our dance programs. Our uh, first priority came into priority number one uh, of our music programs primarily focuses on uh, replacing outdated equipment and instruments uh, to give our students the opportunity to, thank you, give our students the opportunity to uh, have updated equipment and, and operable equipment. So this is pretty much focused on elementary, intermediate, middle and high school. So you're thinking elementary music, choir programs, band programs and orchestra programs. Our next priority one is for our dance programs, and this primarily focuses on installing adequate dance flooring uh, to safe for our students to dance on. Um, and we're looking at the three comprehensive high schools and the opportunity to um, install flooring at our six middle schools so we can have recruitment programs uh, to be able to filter kids through our high school programs to grow those programs. And that's a little over 700,000. Next priority one we have is for visual arts. Um, and the, the primary focus is, is similar to our instruments is replacing outdated art equipment that's been in the district a little over 20 to 30 years. Um, this is for our elementary, intermediate and middle and high school programs. Um, uh, that estimate cost is a little over 580,000. Uh, next priority number two um, for our music programs is to add soundproof practice rooms. Currently we have these at Kerr High School but we want to make sure that we can at least have the opportunity to, to give Elstick, Hastings, and Taylor the, the same uh, soundproof modules uh, that's going up in most of the schools that's getting built today. These modules allow students to kind of record themselves, it's similar to like what a studio recording would look like. And that's a little over 129,000. And our final area we, we discussed was a priority three for theater, and it's focusing strictly on theatrical stage lighting. Um, and this is for intermediate campuses, middle, and our three comprehensive high schools. And that's a little over $1.2 million. Um, again, these things are you know, primarily focused on um, giving our students an opportunity to continue the great things they've been doing um, with more updated equipment so we can kind of level the playing field as well. Thank you. Next slide. I'm sorry, I was muted. I was. I thank Renford, and I'm calling on Kimberly Crow, our Director of uh, Career and Technology Education. Good evening. Thank well, you thank for letting me speak with you again. Um, not sure why I'm getting feedback. All right, there we go. Um, so basically, I'm here to talk about the things that we requested, which ours are primarily equipment based. They're equipment that will age out in the age in the next ten year bond. I know that there were some questions about why. Um, we were already needing equipment. It's the, it's the equipment that has a technology base. And I think I used the iPhone um, as the example. So priority two CT equipment, which would go into our automotive construction, welding and makerspace programs would be at $373,628.50. Our priority three equipment, which would be automotive and industrial robotics in those programs would be $224,818.87. And that's all I have. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, well, I, I congratulate these two. They bought us a little bit of time for a big chunk of work that we're going to uh, look at now. I know you've been waiting to hear about these, uh, your existing facilities. And so I'm going to uh, turn it over in just one minute to these three gentlemen. First of all, I just wanted to mention that all of us understand that this bond that you're constructing uh, is not a growth bond for Adelie ISD. As Mr. Chambers said, a large portion of your considerations will be about maintaining some of the very old buildings uh, and outfitting them for the kind of teaching and learning that uh, your neighboring districts enjoy because Adelie wants uh, their kids to be competitive with anyone in the state of Texas and even in the uh, nation. 
So we're going to talk about the needs of the existing facilities and the projects uh, that and the priorities and the costs that are associated with those. We're, we have a, an architect uh, with Huckabee and his name is Steve Alloway. I've worked with Steve on, uh, on other bond referendums before, so he's not new to this business at all. Huckabee uh, has been vetted by the Board of Trustees, and, and I'm telling you this because I'd like for you to, to uh, consider him a trustworthy uh, person to give you uh, data that's going to influence your decisions. And he, Steve's going to talk to you about the, the factors that they used in arriving at those costs and the good faith estimates and the cost of work. In addition to the projects and priorities and pricings, uh, those the everything that Steve talks about has been also vetted by your district professionals. Uh, pretty much everybody in leadership has had a chance to look at some of these uh, numbers, but most specifically, uh, Jeff Delisle and, and Glenn Jarrett, and your building principals as well have uh, have looked and contributed to the the list that's going to uh, be presented to you. So without uh, exploring that any further, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Delal, your Director of Maintenance, Glenn Jarrett, your Director of Construction and Facilities, and Steve Alloway, who is a partner with Huckabee. Thank you, Michelle. Oh. And uh, this is not switching. I'm going to switch to the next slide. Yes, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, you may see on the on the title it says I'm Craig. I'm not. I'm sitting in his seat. Uh, I sit here so I could actually just kind of run through the slides uh, with this uh, presentation. We appreciate the opportunity. And as Michelle said, this has been a team effort. We've uh, uh, done a lot of work to uh, look at the district, to look at all the facilities in the district. And uh, the uh, the A-Leaf team has been great to work with. I want to first start out with just giving you a quick overview of all of the uh, uh, building needs in the district. And to start with, the district maintains, uh, you know, over 6.5 million square feet of facilities. And actually, Jeff has told me that it's more than that uh, with some of the new facilities as well. Uh, 45,000 students. With those facilities, we have 16 facilities that are over 20 years old, 10 over 40. There's five facilities in the district that are over 50 years old. And um, I put 50 years old because I think back and 50 years old was 1970. And I'm gonna show my age, but to me, 1970 doesn't seem that far, that long ago. But buildings built in 1970 are 50 years old. And, uh, and it's taken an incredible amount of work to, uh, to maintain these facilities in the shape they are today and to, uh, to work with the district on how, how they've done that. We, uh, in our, our team in the district, we've walked every facility. We've walked the rooms in the facilities, the hallways, the roofs, uh, looked at with the engineers, looked at the mechanical systems. Oh, press to, to laptop. So we've... Uh, We've actually walked uh, all the facilities looking at these different areas. You may see on the right, just kind of a uh, typical building needs assessment report. Uh, I'm gonna drag this over. And tell me, Craig, can you see that over there on that? Okay. All right. So this is a, a facility assessment that we have walked in the entire district. So you can see that we've, uh, Walk the administration building, Albright, and I'm just going to kind of scroll down through of where this is. Um, this document can be made available here at the district if anybody really wants to dive into it and look at it. Um, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, particulars that go on and look at this: boiler replacements, roof replacements, uh, bookshelves in a library. Uh, really some needs that happen to a facility over the years and happen to a facility of where we need to make that happen. Um, there's Hastings, Hearn. We've got a lot of skylights that are needing replacement uh, that are, are great bringing in natural light. Uh, but when these uh, skylights age, uh, they do need some maintenance. They do need some repair and they do need some replacement over time. The... Um, 
So we do have a chillers and cooling tower replacements, track resurface, um, parking lot lighting. So there's a lot of parts and pieces that go into this facility assessment. And Jeff, do you want to uh, kind of touch on that assessment as well? Sure, Steve. Uh, this is Jeff Delisle. I'm Director of Maintenance and Operations. Uh, this effort to put together this list is, has been a very complicated, long drawn out process. Of course, my folks see every day and deal with something that's broken every day, something that needs repair, needs replacement. <clears throat> you know, with 7 million square feet, 60 buildings, there's always something that's that going on in every given day. Most of these things are small, uh, but they're, you know, not small enough, not large enough to be on a list like this. But uh, we, we keep track of, you know, through the years, uh, we keep track of things that need to be done. We see things out there that are, that are big projects that are some, not something my folks are gonna tackle. Uh, so we keep that ongoing list every year and, and keep adding to it. Uh, additionally, after the bond in 2011, there were things that didn't make that bond. You know, they were priority threes or fours back then. Well, now we reevaluated all those to see, you know, where do those need to go now? Can we put them off a little longer or do they need to rise to the forefront? And then I had my folks beginning in December to walk schools and, and just because let's pick up everything that we, we think we know things, but everything may not be on the list. So my folks walked schools and then Steve and his up folks, his architects, engineering firm, they came in and, and walked the buildings too. So we had multiple lists, Steve had lists. And so we've spent the past couple of months going through those lists, uh, taking out the duplications uh, trying to further refine those lists. You know, he may have had an opinion that differed from ours. You know, we might have known some, some background history that he didn't know. So we've scrubbed those lists and uh, got them down to this one big list and, and tried to prioritize them and go from there. So that's sort of the process. This didn't happen overnight. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing document almost. Uh, we realize that uh, at some point it's going to have to be final, but, uh, you know, things that don't make this list, we'll go on the list for the next bond. And that's, that's how we maintain and that's how we keep looking at things that have to happen. So. Thanks, Jeff. And I, I do want to highlight one thing he said is the, uh, you know, a lot of the minor items are not on this list. Painting walls, uh, if a door needs repaired or hardware is not working, you know, those are maintenance type items. These are, these are really building quality items that are needed over time. Uh, to keep those buildings, to maintain those buildings in, in really good shape. So with that, um, we do have the priorities that Michelle had outlined originally, uh, priority one, one to three years. As Jeff mentioned, some of these priorities can kind of slide a year back and forth, uh, depending on uh, when those funds are available to make those projects happen. Uh, so priority one, uh, Typically in there is carpet replacements, some mechanical electrical plumbing systems, roof replacements, uh, some fire alarm upgrades, some vinyl wall covering replacements throughout the school, uh, some gym floor replacements. Priority twos, we're looking at MEP, masonry. There's some playground equipment that's, that's really old and uh, needing to be replaced. Some fencing at some schools, uh, window replacements, again, roofs and carpet. Uh, priority threes, looking at some site lighting, parking lot paving, uh, some casework replacements, uh, HVAC. I think a couple of schools do have casework replacements, and those are, you know, 40-year-old casework that is still functioning uh, to a degree. Been a lot of repairs and a lot of, uh, a lot of work to make that happen, so it, it is time for that. Um, so I just wanted to quickly kind of go through what are some of those, uh, and, and this is this put together you know, somewhat just you can kind of visualize what some of these items are. We're not going in depth of every single item that's on this list, but for our site assessment is one way we break it out, walking the site to partial list of items. There are some parking lot paving replacements. You can just see the, the age on some of those uh, play areas, marquee signs. Uh, there's a hard top play area at, uh, at Boone Elementary School that, uh, uh, is in need of replacement. It has served its time. Uh, in building needs assessment for the site, priority one, you can see a list of uh, schools for priority one on building needs assessment for site. And that probable cost is about 4.9 million. Priority two, 
the campus is there, 5.9 million, and priority three, the campus is there, 17 million. And I might point out too, when I use the term campuses, we're looking at all facilities in the district, okay? Whether it's a school or a maintenance facility or transportation, we are looking at every facility in the district. Um, exterior assessment, there's a lot of exterior metal panels at the district that are in need of repair. Uh, Albright Elementary School, Boone Elementary School, and there's some masonry replacement and waterproofing that's needing some uh, attention uh, at a few campuses. You can see that uh, Priority One, there's only four campuses on Priority One, about $6 million. Priority Two, a number of other campuses, about $5 million, and Priority Three, about $700,000. Uh, interior assessment, we're looking at a Carpet replacements, uh, some foundation repairs, replacing folding partitions. Uh, on the left, you see at Taylor High School, a very large folding partition. Over time, that's a functioning, moving uh, piece of equipment. And over time, that does need to be replaced. Uh, at the natatorium, there's some insulation replacement around that natatorium that's needing to, uh, needing to be replaced. Uh, some of the restroom upgrades. <clears throat> you can see priority ones, a lot of that interiors covers almost all of the campuses. Uh, there's, there's something going on at those campuses, about 16 million. Priority two, about 28 million. And priority three, a little over 2 million. And these priorities have been gone over back and forth, pushing and pulling and trying to, you know, really prioritize where do these need to fit in that list. Roofing replacements, uh, we're looking at the Calwall skylight on that upper right. Uh, the uh, uh, and, and replacing roofs throughout the district. We can say priority one, there's a lot of uh, roofs. A lot of those schools are an eight classroom addition. Those classroom additions are all built about the same time. They're all in need of a roof replacement uh, through the age. Priority two, about 39 million. Priority three, about a million. Uh, mechanical assessments, replacing some mechanical units. These are some images of some newer units uh, just to give you a visual of what, you know, what an air handler unit looks like, uh, what a cooling tower and a chiller looks like, uh, generators some different things. Um, so mechanical, you can see priority one is about 78 million. That's where a large piece of, uh, uh, of the cost is. For a district to, to run these buildings at, you know, 7 million square feet of building, there's a lot of mechanical to make that happen. Priority two, about 29 million. And priority three, really all of these items need to be done and we've pushed some into priority two, but as Jeff said, depending on where that money is, is where that will, uh, you know, where that goes. Electrical assessments, again, generators, electrical switch gear, fire alarm systems, priority one, uh, you can see the campuses about 6 million, priority two, about 15, and priority three. Uh, plumbing assessments, uh, again, fire water line supply, domestic boiler replacement, uh, priority one, about 770,000, priority two and priority three, and the campuses associated with those. Um, so we'll get to a summary sheet and that uh, we list the priorities. All told, we're looking at priority one being about $135 million across the district. Uh, you can see the breakout per site, exterior, interior roofing. Uh, priority two, about 126 million. And priority three, about 21, almost 22 million. Um, again, been a lot of vetting out, pushing and pulling as to where those items need to be and what's what's really in 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 need uh, at the moment. Steve, Steve, if I could go back to that slide just a second. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention to everybody is life cycle replacements. Um, a lot of things in here, a lot of things in the district, we replace as they come, you know, we repair them, we patch them up, we keep them going as long as we can. But there are certain things that we, we have on life cycle replacements. And, and what a life cycle replacement is, we have determined at, at X number of years, we're going to replace something. And we do this uh, to make sure that we don't ever reach an ultimate failure. We, we, we try to get as much life as we can, but we don't push the envelope. And, and I'd like to use the analogy of, you know, you take your car to the mechanic, you get an oil change, and he says, you need to replace your belts and hoses. And you say, and you say well, how much is it? And they tell you, and you go, well, I'll, I'll come back later. And then sure enough, what happens is you're at rush hour traffic on Southwest Freeway. It's August 23rd, and your radiator hose breaks. And you are stuck there, and you go, man, I wish I'd have replaced that radiator hose. I pushed it too far. Well, that's sort of the way we are with some of these, these life cycle replacements uh, items. 
you know, we can keep the mechanical going and we can repair this and we can repair that, but we never want to be in a situation where we lose all our air conditioning on a hot, hot day when we're in the middle of, of uh, testing for the kids and, and they're trying to do their best and make their best scores. And we got a school that within just a matter of, you know, 10 or 15 minutes goes from being 72 degrees to 82 degrees. So that's what life cycle replacements are. Uh, the majority of things on these lists, especially the priority ones and twos, are life cycle replacements. We can patch roofs all the time, but we don't ever want to be in a position where we get a big heavy rain, we get a big giant rain event, we get a Harvey, heaven forbid not, and you know we've we flooded part of our building because we waited too long to do that roof. So a lot of these priority ones and twos are set up on certain years when they have when we've determined they've reached their end of life and we need to replace them. Now, having said that, we can move those things back a year or two one way or the other, and we do that quite often. We say, well, this didn't, this didn't go as bad as we thought. Maybe we can move something up here that is in worse shape than it is. And so I just wanted everybody to be aware that uh, when you see so many ones and twos, the majority of those are part of this life cycle replacement. Thank you, Thank Jeff. You. I'm going to keep moving here in a, in a isn't of time. The... Uh, the next item we have is the uh, new construction and comprehensive. Steve, can yes. I interrupt before we move forward? Just can I ask you a, a couple of questions that I think the committee would like to uh, hear from you about? Absolutely. Uh, number one, I'd like for you to someone to tell the committee where they could view the facilities assessment if they want to get into the uh, weeds on each individual piece of it, where can they see that huge document? Um, Ms. Rodriguez, do you want to respond to that? I know we talked about it. Being yeah, what, what we talked in the Michelle, I believe, in, in, in following suit with, with uh, the last bond that we had binders that were, that had, that were available when we met face to face and they were at, at the tables. So what, what we will plan to do is to uh, print out the, this document and make it available here in the business office should someone want to come out and see it uh, and view it. Um, so uh, that was our plan to do it that way um, and, and just make it available uh, for anyone who wants to really go into depth on, on, on in for the facilities assessment. Thank you, Hilda. I think I doubt that very many members of the committee want to see those those individual uh, price uh, projects, painting a door jam or replacing a carpet here or there, but we certainly, uh, the district has always wanted to maintain a high level of accessibility and transparency for the committee. So the district was uh, concerned that that document be, is available to you. And also, Steve, the, uh, the question always arises, and on Zoom, we're somewhat limited in that the committee can't ask this, so I'm going to ask for the committee, how do you arrive at the pricing for, for these uh, projects? A great question. The, uh, the pricing comes from uh, historical data. It comes from uh, real bids that we're receiving uh, currently. Uh, we are able to uh, analyze cost across the state with offices across the state and right here in Houston. And, and as you can imagine, different parts of the state have different varying cost. Uh, but uh, we do rely on our in-house uh, cost estimator. We rely on contractors and we rely on engineers and subcontractors to look at this pricing. So, so keep in mind that the, uh, you know, the prices you see, these are full uh, project cost, I call them. So they include uh, permitting and, you know, you sometimes, uh, uh, just as an example, if you build a uh, an addition to a building, well, you think, well, that's the addition and the cost. But but with commercial construction, you're also having to consider that you have to put in site detention, you have to put in so much parking, you have to put in all the other things that come along with that. So so these numbers are reflective of that. And and I just want to point out that we are not bidding this project. We are not building this project. We're trying to use our best information to predict if we put this on the street for a contractor to publicly bid multiple bidders on the contract we are predicting and analyzing what we believe that probable cost will be so 
Uh, sometimes it is a little confusing thinking we're actually bidding and going to do the project for that price. We're just trying to predict what the contractors are going to bid that price for. And and Steve, uh, I, would you discuss the uh, presence of an inflation uh, factor uh, today's dollars versus the dollars that might be there when we begin these projects? Yes, absolutely. Right now, the uh, dollars that we have in this uh, assessment are today's dollars. And I believe Mr. Woods mentioned at a previous meeting that we would be adding those inflation dollars once we determine how long this bond is and how far it goes out. Uh, right now, we're looking at about 6% a year. There's some crazy things going on in the market right now. You see, anytime you see gas prices fluctuating, it goes across the entire market. Right now, we're seeing a lot of fluctuations in steel. So we do not have inflation built into these numbers. We don't have a lot of contingency built into these numbers now. So once as a committee, we determine how long that will be, we'll come back and, and put those numbers into that final uh, assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I apologize for interrupting you, but I knew the committee was going to uh, want to have those pieces of information. Well, so that's, that's why we've worked together before and you know the questions to ask, so thank you. You're welcome. You please continue. So, so Michelle, just a logistical question, real quick. I set my timer. Uh, I, I presume you're watching it, but uh, we've got a another another big piece to go here. So, <laughs> and, you, and you have about eight extra minutes. So oh, thank you. Really okay. Good shape. Okay, I'm going to start that timer over. Thank you. Uh, new construction elementary schools. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chambers indicated at the start of the meeting that this facility, this bond committee has a great opportunity to really look at the direction of the district. And this piece right here, I'm just really excited about to show what you as a committee have the opportunity to do uh, in the vision of Ailey ISD. Uh, where are we going as a district? What are we, what are we looking at doing? I've got a couple of images up here. Uh, 57 years ago, uh, that's an image. I, I just found these on the internet. Okay, these are, these are not anything here. 57 years ago uh, is a classroom on the left. 50 years ago is a, a classroom on the right. You can see there wasn't a whole lot of change from 57 years ago to 50 years ago. Okay, I'm now going to uh, talk about what a school is today. So today when we look at, uh, today when we look at the, uh, when we look at new school, it's really all about flexibility. It's about a school being a learning environment any place you turn, anywhere you go. It's visually stimulating. There, there's a lot of uh, enrichment in the schools today of, uh, of the student involvement, of the student participation, of the uh, different areas where a teacher can go to deliver curriculum. Uh, you can see on that lower right-hand corner, there's a teacher having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student while another group of students, student-led, are over on a large marker board with movable furniture actually having a small group uh, uh, learning activity. And, and uh, I like to say today, a teacher is more of a facilitator. They're, they're facilitating that learning. They're, they're really bringing to life uh, all the imaginative things that the kids are coming up with today and all the learning opportunities they have. Uh, there's a lot of outdoor learning going on. Again, just that ability to move kids around, move students around, and bringing to life any opportunity for that learning. The, uh, the middle top picture there, you can see just a, a boulevard of different areas where teachers can take their students, uh, uh, do different activities. You can see in the uh, lower middle, the uh, uh, learning environment, different types of seating, different types of tables, <clears throat> charts on the wall. The lower right, we are looking today at a lot of movable partitions where you can have a closed off classroom, you can open the door, you can combine two classrooms, three classrooms, you can have small group activities. Um, the uh, middle top picture you can look at, uh, there's, a, there's a full folding partition there that's also a marker board. So those students, there's areas up high the teachers can reach, down low the students can reach. So you're not seeing just a standard marker board on the walls anymore. Uh, in the bottom middle, you can see just the, the word there, makerspace, back through that wall is a makerspace. There's a lot of manipulatives, a lot of things that the, uh, is hands-on learning that the teachers are using. Uh, over on the upper right is a, a production studio. That's a green room. 
And that school every day does their morning live production for their morning announcements. It allows those students to, that opportunity. Uh, so I'm gonna, you know, outdoor learning, you can see the bottom middle, that's, the, uh, that's what we've referred to now as a learning commons, uh, was referred to as a library. I used to say a library was a really quiet place and we built small little rooms off to the side for quiet, for, for louder students. Today, a library is very lively and a lot of active kids and off to the side is a quiet room where quiet activities can take place. Uh, the picture on the left, I'm gonna go back to it, was 57 years ago. The picture on the right is a photo that I took last week of Ewan's Elementary School. Uh, I believe the back right desk is the same desk that's in the uh, picture on the 57 years ago. That's a testament to the district. That is not a criticism. That is a testament to the district of being, a, being able to utilize these facilities for 57 years as the age of uh, Ewan's Elementary School. Um, you can see there on the right, it's, a, it's made up of a long school. There's been a, 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 a kindergarten wing uh, out to the left and portable buildings are kind of in that yellow color with a gymnasium back to the right or down in the middle. Uh, the hallways are, are institutional, very nice. Uh, you know, they've, uh, they've been maintained well. Um, you can see the uh, pathways out to the uh, gymnasium. The, uh, they've kind of outgrown the cafeteria. They've moved the uh, serving lines out into the cafeteria, pathway out to the portable buildings. Uh, this is the pathway out to the uh, kindergarten classroom wing and then inside the kindergarten classroom wing. So the teacher is very creative doing a lot of things and I'm, I'm gonna try to get on through this. 50 years ago today, the picture on the left, the picture on the right is Chambers Elementary School. I'm gonna back up one, I'm sorry. At Ewan's Elementary School, the proposal that the district is looking at and asking the district to, or the committee to consider is a major renovation and addition, pulling those portable buildings into the main school, doing a major overhaul of that facility, um, but keeping Ewan's Elementary School where it is and, and just doing a major renovation addition to it. About $37 million for that uh, total project cost. Uh, at Chambers Elementary School is the other elementary school. This one is having some uh, movement uh, in the foundation, there's, a, there's some maintenance going on at that school every year. You can see on the left, uh, the 57 or 50 years ago on the right is the classroom today. Uh, it, desks are spread out a little further because of COVID, but uh, typically they're, they're more like on the left. Um, <clears throat> there was a new front entry that was put not too long ago. The thought is on the right hand side to build a new Chambers Elementary School up where the current Spark Park is to utilize that new entry uh, that's at Chambers to maintain that and have that the new entrance to the Spark Park. Um, just some images in uh, uh, Chambers Elementary, you can see the, uh, the hallways, the classrooms, um, uh, the library, there has been some upgrade of furniture in the library. You can see the uh, play space off on the right. Uh, they, and the uh, district has done a great job of of facilitating the children and students in this uh, space. The, uh, real quick, the Ag Center. Uh, I'm sorry, Michelle, any, any questions on that real quick before I move into the Ag Center? I did want to mention also probable cost of about $42.5 million for Chambers Elementary School. So I'm going to move on to the Ag Science Center. Um, Kim, do you want to you say a couple of things on this slide? I think you're muted if you are. Okay. I am, thanks, sorry about that. All right, um, I wanna say th thank you again for allowing me to speak with you about the Agricultural Science Center. I'm sure that some of you are not even aware of the fact that ALEAF even has an ag program, much less a facility that's located in West Houston. Um, I'm having some issues with my technology, so if y'all just spare right with me for a minute, sorry. All right, sorry about that. Okay, um, it's a, it, uh, our ag program is in ALEAF FFI. We currently have a 13,000 square foot facility located off of Highway 6. The facility was built in the late 90s on a piece of property the district owned. The current facility has approximately 17 pens, 12 cages, and eight coops. 
In recent years, to accommodate the desire of students to raise poultry, we had to convert the existing storage shed that you see in the upper part of the picture with the green roof um, into a, to house the chicken coops, the eight coops. And what you have to realize with the coops is that holds 25 chickens each. So when we refer to a student project, a student raising chickens, it's actually 25 to a coop. Limitations of the current facility include zero restrooms. Um, if you notice over on the right-hand side of the picture, there's a little blue porta potty. That is what our students, advisors, and parents currently use when they have to use the restroom when they're out of the facility. Limited parking. It prevents the facility from being used to host livestock shows or allow buses to bring other students out on field trips, such as environmental science has come out in small groups to do water sampling labs. And even our art classes have come out in small groups to do the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Art Contest preparation. The white area by the blue little, that's the only parking that we have that is not on, um, on grass area. Limited access, the current road into the property is down a lane that is a right of way and does not easily accommodate buses or even trucks pulling large tra trailers. An additional access issue is with the current location of the facility that a student who must provide their own transportation to and from twice a day to feed their animals. They go before school starts and they go again in the evenings to feed their animals. And it's not located near any form of public transportation. And in reality is not even a bike ride away for a lot of our students. It's limited space is another thing. As mentioned above, you can see that as the program has grown due to the current allocation of pens, cages and coops, we have had to limit the number of students participating in the number of projects. Each student is allowed to house at the facility. On this slide, you'll see that the trends in participation prior to COVID, had, we had great student interest and participation in the program. In 1819, we were over 50 students participating in animal projects with some of those taking place at students' homes. And in 1920, we were at the same level. Based upon our pen, cage, and coop availability, we were limited to approximately 40 students having annual projects in the existing facility. If you look at our numbers, this has been about a third of our students who are, have membership in FFA and about one tenth of our enrollment in ag science classes. Because of COVID this year, we have had to limit the number of students who could participate to those who already had existing projects. We didn't add any new projects, which are why our numbers are down. Based upon the jumps in participation starting in the 1819 school year with the number of students showing animals and based upon the number of students currently enrolled in ag science programs, we feel there will be a quick rebound of student animal projects and interest once we are no longer limiting the participation. So if we can go to the next slide, Steve. As mentioned previously, our desire has been to allow all of ag science students to have opportunity to participate in activities at the facility and to host other district programs as well. But with the current location of facility, that is not feasible. The district has identified a site already owned by the district, centrally located, that could house the Ag Science Center. This location is next to the current Aleaf Community Gardens, which would provide opportunity for a continued partnership between not only the district and the community gardens, but our Ag Science and the community gardens. The new facility would also provide students in the entire Ag Science program the opportunity to visit the center for various projects, events, contests, et cetera. It would also allow the opportunity for us to collaborate not only with the science program and the fine arts program in new and unique ways that we haven't been able to in the past because of lack of access, lack of parking and lack of restrooms. And Steve, I'll let you take back over. And Kimberly, I, you know, one thing that I just love about working with the district is one thing she mentioned there is the community and the community gardens. I, I have not been in a meeting yet that they, the district has not talked about the entire community, okay? It's always about the entire community. It's always about all students and, and all learning and all teachers and all parents. And, and I love that about this. And that's why they, uh, they did ask to look at just a kind of a conceptual layout of about a 20,000 square foot Ag Science Center that could be here, that could offer some support to that garden it could offer a, a, a small uh, practice show arena for these students where they can actually practice showing their animals and uh, a great place to house the student projects, the animals themselves. Uh, so, so this is an opportunity that we have at about uh, six and a half million dollars um, to put this facility right on Beach Nut and Dairy View. There are just some precedent images of a uh, of what a facility could be, what it could look like, the uh, uh, animal pens, 
and the uh, student involvement that can take place with the district for this facility. I'm gonna to touch on an item that was brought, uh, moving on, I'm gonna to touch on an item that was brought up at one of the first meetings where uh, a, the uh, athletic director went over the uh, Crump Stadium and all of the athletics for the district. And, and one item at that point, we had a, a, a two-story freestanding press box that the, uh, the value of that um, press box, that new press box was, uh, was pretty high. So the district went back and looked at uh, still renovating that press box, but looking at a, uh, a version that would actually add on to the existing press box, renovate the existing press box, and uh, create the spaces needed for the district. So that price tag significantly lower is about six and a half million dollars for adding on, putting some viewing decks, uh, putting film deck and some different things on that existing press box. So that's uh, something we're, we're backing up on, touching back on. We listened to the committee of, of what were some other ideas and thoughts for that, uh, for that Crump Stadium. Uh, Want to move on. Uh, another uh, project that we've looked at is front entry canopies. Now, in the last bond, um, we had the opportunity to create new entrances for some of the elementary schools. Weren't able to do all of them, uh, but we're able to do a number of them. Uh, this bond, we're looking at the uh, some additional uh, elementary schools and creating a new vision, a new front for those schools. You can see Sneed Elementary, Best, and Boone, uh, the images of those schools, Kennedy, Landis, and Mahaney, um, and uh, where they sit today, along with uh, a Leaf Middle, Ollie, and Killo. And in these schools, you can see, um, can use some enhancements in those front entries, some curb appeal. Uh, these are just some images from the last bond of what happened at uh, some of the schools. You can see uh, Alexander on the left. And I'm just gonna flip through a couple of these. So with those, a summary sheet on that is the, uh, we are looking at all priority ones. Uh, they have assigned a priority two with the Ag Science Center. I'm gonna say again, as Michelle has repeated multiple times, the committee has an opportunity to look at those priorities, okay? This is just the district's uh, first pass at that. Uh, well, not first pass, many passes, but this is what they've landed on with those priorities. So they are looking at a uh, UN's elementary school at about 37 million, Chambers Elementary School about 42 and a half, Crump Press Box at about six and a half. That's the uh, addition and, and uh, renovation to that press box. Front entry canopies about four and a half million, and the Ag Science Center about six and a half million. Uh, so Michelle, I'm going to breathe now, and uh, hope that wasn't too much of a uh, of a information overload. But I do know that you've got some opportunities to talk about that, come back and, and pick it apart and look at some different things. So uh, thank you. We will do that. Uh, Steve, I have a question that I know will come up, so I may as well ask you right now uh, that the press box, uh, that priority one at 6.5 million, uh, if, it's, if that stays on this new, uh, new construction uh, piece of our presentation, the the original presentation of that will come off of athletics is that true that, or will this have to stay with athletics and therefore on a separate proposition it would have to stay with athletics on a separate proposition and miss rodriguez is running a full spreadsheet on all of the presentations that have taken place thus far so yes a great question and the uh and, and again, the committee has the opportunity to look at both of those. You know, uh, what's the what do they feel is the best for that stadium? Okay, thank you. You did a great job. I didn't realize I was quite that scary that you worried about your time, but you did a great job and came in well <laughs> under your allotted time. Oh, thank you. Uh, up until until now tonight, we've been talking about bricks and mortar and about all of the uh, the upgrades and maintenance things that have to be done to our building. But 
now we're going to circle back to our why. Uh, our committee, uh, we have the, the big why in front of us, and that is our kids. Uh, everything we do and every project that's presented, every uh, every piece of maintenance, every carpet that goes in, every HVAC, every every electrical, everything that's done is is to benefit our kids the very best way we can. In fact, I heard that Mr. Chambers has a, a quote and I love it, I'm gonna use it from now on. He said, construction follows instruction. And I he must say that a lot because I've heard it from several people uh, as we've met. So tonight we wanna end our presentations back in the classroom where the kids are and Pam Lowe, who did such a great job talking to us before about digital learning. She's the director of digital learning. She's gonna talk with us about smart classrooms of the future. And as your, uh, as the bond steering committee, you tonight you have the opportunity to look into the future and make it now. So Pam, would you talk to us about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Greetings, Ailey Feisty Bond Steering Committee. Um, it is a pleasure to join you again tonight to discuss the smart learning environments for the 21st century and beyond. And um, just as Michelle said, just to jog your memory, I first presented to you during um, session number three. And that's when I um, discussed at a very high level, a high perspective of how education has changed during the first 21 years of the 21st century. So as promised, um, I'm back tonight to dig into the granular details of the learning environments that our, our students deserve. So that's my goal tonight. I will share our vision of the learning environment through our kids' eyes, what our students should see in ALEF ISD classrooms, how our students should hear in ALEF ISD classrooms, and then finally, how our students should engage in the 21st century and beyond learning environment. So uh, just to talk about the structure, um, I will outline the priority first, and then um, I'll state it as the goal, basically what we're trying to accomplish. And then I will talk about the how. And the how is the ask. It is how we plan to achieve the goal. So on the next slide, we can get started. Um, oh, one, one slide back, please. Um, this slide is important because it frames our thought processes for the vision. The statement that you see at the very beginning to provide standardized technology equipment slash resources to give all students equitable opportunities to succeed. That information in bold, it actually comes directly from our um, ALEAF ISD board priority on equity. So when we're thinking about the smart learning environment of the future, of the, of the now, we're thinking from the perspective of ensuring that we have standardized equipment for our students. Regardless of where they are in the district, there should be comparable equipment that our students are able to um, utilize. So I will uh, talk about the state-of-the-art technology, um, the presentations that you saw about possible uh, new facilities. Um, the gentleman discussed flexible classroom arrangement. He talked about hubs of creativity. I, I almost thought that maybe he took a, a, a bird's eye view into my presentation because it was everything that we talked about uh, during session three and I'm talking about tonight. So um, these are things that our students deserve um, and it's imperative that we provide that standardized uh, set of equipment for them. So on the next slide, we will dig into the first ask. It's a priority one. Um, and it is to provide the latest technology resources for ALEAF ISD students. And that is in the form of interactive boards. Now, an interactive board is basically a uh, big screen 
touch screen television that's interactive and really it serves as a computer. Um, so as you see in this photograph, these three photographs, you see three different Ailey ISD students, and they are engaging with these interactive boards in their classroom, um, anywhere from uh, engaging in math activities to uh, phonics in the center. And on the far left, you see a student engaging in uh, vocabulary development. So these interactive boards um, uh, should be in every single classroom. So on the next slide, you'll see another example of uh, an Ailey ISD classroom. And if you'll move to the next slide. Thank you. So this is one classroom at uh, Martin Elementary, I believe. And you see four different students from the same classroom engaging with the interactive board uh, for a math lesson. And you see that this is a recent photo. They're all wearing their masks. Um, again, uh, notice that each student engaging, interacting with the technology. Uh, we know this touchscreen technology is constantly changing. Um, and as we uh, learn more about the changes, I think about the type of technology that we saw in movies like Minority Report and movies like um, Iron Man, where the touch screens were actually clear. So that type of technology is actually now coming into the educational space. So with this priority, and it's a priority one, if we move to the next slide, it's important that our students have the ability to showcase what they're learning with these interactive boards in the classroom. So on the next slide, you'll see two final students. And these students are actually from uh, one of our coding camps that we host during the summer. And of course, this was before COVID. Um, this is Youngblood Elementary, excuse me, Youngblood Intermediate. And um, these, two, these two students actually created their own uh, video games. And it wasn't just these two, it was the entire coding camp. So students created their own video games uh, using the coding software Scratch. So on the left side of the screen of each of those uh, in interactive boards, you actually see the code that the students uh, created to make their game work. And on the right side, you actually see um, a snapshot of what the video game looked uh, like. So these students leveraged the interactive board not only to share with their classmates um, their thought process behind their code, but to actually also play the game uh, to showcase their code in action. Um, the interactive boards in order to get those boards in every single classroom in Aleph ISD and every single library, it would be $24 million. Now, this includes um, the replacement cycle um, of the interactive boards, as well as the new boards in classrooms that currently do not have boards. So that's the first piece, what our students see and how our students engage in the 21st century and beyond learning environment. So now we're gonna move on to the next section. And it's so interesting that the gentleman uh, talked about uh, our libraries. And um, when we think about our libraries, we think about what our students see and really how they feel. The library is the heart of the school. And if you think back to your own school experience, how many of you remember uh, just loving uh, when you visited the library on a weekly basis or a daily basis to check out books? Did you go as a whole class? Sometimes did you go with a friend, you get the library pass and you go to the library and you just could not wait. You could not wait to uh, check out that next book because you knew that there was a special treasure that would allow you to escape to a faraway land 
um, or a treasure that would help you uh, research specific topics like snakes, dinosaurs, or the continent of Africa. Back in those days, um, if you remember when you picked up a book and you opened it, at the back, there was that little sleeve where you pulled out your card and you'd write your name in pencil and you take your card and your book up to the circulation desk to check out the book. Um, if you remember that type of library, um, that reinforces uh, 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 the impact that the library had on you as a child. And it's still that way today. Um, just so everyone knows, Aleaf ISD has the, uh, has the number one library program in the state. Uh, we have the best library program in the state. And while I'm probably a bit biased, I have, uh, we, we have an award to back up that statement and you see it on your screen. Uh, the Libraries Change Communities Award was actually awarded to Aleaf ISD from the Texas Library Association. And it was awarded to our program because of our collaborative effort to promote innovative library-based initiatives that involve the community. Um, so uh, there's only been one other time in the association's history that that award was given to a K-12 school. So as I just mentioned, we have a first rate library program that is run by Sharla Hollingsworth and our librarians do amazing work for our students. So on the next slide, you'll see why updating our libraries is a priority one. The physical environment, as you saw on those updated photos of, of schools, the physical environment of a library really sets the tone for the entire school. And you see on this photograph, you see tall book, bookshelves, interior bookshelves that are tall, you see older furniture, and these are the things that we want to update. So we're thinking from the lens of what our students see and how our students feel when they walk into the library space. So these libraries need a facelift and we can create that environment very easily. So on the next slide, I wanted to share that we've been on the library transformation road for a few years now. Um, and we've had limited funds. And we've been good stewards with the funding that we've received every year. But you see, we've only been able to make a small dent in the environment. And it's taken multiple years to achieve the goal. So if we move to the next slide, we want to be able to transform, uh, transform the library space. Again, by replacing those tall and interior bookcases and really updating the remaining furniture that we have not been able to do with the limited funds that we've had over the last five years. And the cost for that priority one, the library physical environment update or facelift is $1.5 million. All right. And before you go on, did I miss that or is that on every elementary campus? Uh, yes, so if you go back to the previous slide, the one that has the chart, yes. So um, over the last five uh, to six years, we have been replacing uh, furniture and tables, tables and chairs a, a little, little at a time. Um, and we're at the point now where we're moving to mobile bookcases. So you see in 1920, we were able to tackle one campus and they received four mobile bookcases. So we would like to transform all of the bookcases that are tall and interior to really open up that uh, instructional space in the libraries and make them the commons or the, the hub of the, of the, of the school uh, as we outlined earlier. Now, there are some schools that still have or still need um, updated furniture. So that $1.5 million price tag would tackle, tackle both of those. Did that answer your question, Michelle? 
wanted to make sure the committee was clear on that. Please go on. Okay, awesome. That is no problem whatsoever. So a priority two is a classroom sound amplification system. And our goal here is to distribute a speaker's voice at the same level throughout the entire classroom. And we could achieve this through uh, uh, sound amplification systems in all classrooms and libraries. Um, if you take a look at the picture on the right, the blue picture, this is an example of a sound amplification system that sits on a tabletop. And what is critical about the sound system, it um, actually allows students to listen to the teacher for instruction. It allows students to listen to other students for, for uh, collaborative instruction. And then it allows the teacher to listen in to real-time feedback um, and give real-time feedback to students. Uh, in terms of listening activities in a classroom, 75% of a child's typical school day, they're listening. And for younger students, they need to receive 90 to 100% of the information carried by the spoken word to get the full meaning of a particular concept. So again, our priority too is to outfit our classrooms so our students can hear, regardless of where they are in the classroom, what their teacher or other students are saying with those sound, sound amplification systems. Um, the red picture, it actually is a diagram of a sound amplification system that is uh, positioned in the ceiling. Um, therefore, it can't be moved around, but there is the technology out there that will bring a crystal clear voice to every student in the classroom, regardless of where they're sitting. So on the final slide, I've outlined three priorities. First, outfitting every Ailey classroom and library with an interactive smart board. And that is a priority one at a price tag of $24 million. Secondly, updating and giving our libraries a facelift by incorporating um, mobile bookshelves, as well as finishing off that flexible furniture. That is a priority one at a price tag of $1.5 million. And then finally, implementing a sound amplification system in all A-Leaf ISD classrooms, that is a priority two, and it is uh, $16.5 million. And again, for the interactive boards, as well as the amplification system, that includes the replacement cycle cost. Thank you, Cam. <clears throat> uh, I have just two things I want the committee to be uh, to pieces of information. First of all, uh, Kimberly, <laughs> how many students are there in the ag program currently? We currently have 862 students participating in the 2021 school year. Okay, and Glenn, uh, are you on? I would like to know uh, if you had anything that you wanted to add about the press box since the scope of work was reduced. Yeah, I wanted to uh, circle back on that and let the committee know. Uh, Steve touched on it vaguely, but uh, what we've looked at, instead of doing a two-story press box, we're basically uh, reutilizing the current press box we are doing a, uh, an expansion of it. In other words, we're bringing it out more towards the front and we are still having the elevator tower that was planned for in, you know, that was discussed way back in 2014 at that time uh, to make the space uh, more spacious and, and usable. Uh, up there also, you know, you're gonna have the uh, area for the CTE students 
you'll have the area for the uh, board, you'll have the area for the visitors, home coaches, and also for recruiters up in that area, along with uh, on each side, uh, underneath the current awning up there will be a viewing deck on each side to where on beautiful fall uh, evenings that if you wanna go out there and, and watch the activities that you can. And that's really all I wanted to, no. Thank you, Glenn. I'm glad that you were able to jump in and give us that extra information. And Pam, thank you for talking about these classrooms of the future that could start as early as uh, a year from now. So that's exciting. Uh, you know the, the drill. You've had three very big pieces of information that were uh, presented to you in the way of the facilities assessment, the uh, new construction needs, and then the uh, classrooms of the future that Pam talked about. So you have three big things to talk about, and you know we're going to uh, let you go into your smaller groups. I'll remind you that you do have a facilitator in those groups, but that facilitator is not the leader of the group. The facilitator is neutral to the, to the uh, content of your discussions. And as soon as, uh, as the, about 30 minutes, I'm gonna leave you in your groups for about 30 minutes, but I'll give you a five minute warning. And at that point, uh, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to formulate one question. And I, I think Mr. Chambers, uh, with regard to the new construction, uh, there's actually three areas that I want you to discuss. So in 30 minutes, I'm not gonna hold you to, 10 minutes on each one of those three because one might take a little more time than others. Uh, but uh, one thing that Mr. Chambers mentioned that, that I want to reiterate is that at some point with your aging facilities, then you're going to want to get a, on a schedule of replacement that's reasonable over the next several years. So that might be part of your discussions as well. So you'll discuss the facilities assessment, You'll talk about the new construction, uh, including that press box. And then you'll also talk about the technology that Pam talk, uh, discussed with us uh, for the classrooms of the future. So we're going to send you to your groups now. Have a good time. I'm going to visit you briefly if I can. Well, welcome home, Bond Steering Committee. Uh, I, I asked the questions and uh, it sounds like you all had some good discussions in your group, so I can't wait uh, to hear from you. Kim, you wanna help me out on this because I'm not sure I know exactly uh, who has what table. So is, is it the same as last time? It is. But I can, if you want me to start calling out tables to hear from, you can tell me. Yeah, let's do, if you'll do that, I'm missing my sheet on that. Okay. Uh, and tell me the name of the facilitator when we do that. Let's just let's just be uh, predictable and start with group one. That would be Daryl Alexander. I remember that. Okay. Yes, and I say this every time we start with the best. So, uh, <laughs> Miss Malik is our spokesperson uh, for our our burning question. So, Miss Malik. Okay, our burning question is while buildings are being renovated and new facilities are being built, are environmentally friendly materials gonna be utilized like LED lights, um, double pane windows, um, just materials that are gonna be toxic to the environment and are gonna reduce our carbon footprint? Great question. Mr. Alloway or, or uh, Jeff, who wants to tackle that? I can I could start out on so so to answer that question is yes uh, and I'll, I'll further uh, describe that a little bit there are a lot of new energy codes out that that require any public building to meet those energy codes and those do have to do with LED lighting they have to do with the energy efficiency of the building uh, they have to do with the VOCs in the uh, uh, in the materials that we're using so. To put a, a simple answer to that is yes, the environment is very, uh, very much a part of today's building code and very much a part of the uh, uh, educational architects that are that are doing facilities for children. 
Great question, Ms. Malik, thank you. Uh, I think number two is Sean, is that correct? Yes, yes Sean Williams. Uh, and, and we had such rich conversation that we forgot to designate a, a speaker. So I'll, I'll just pose our question. We didn't have any uh, specific about the construction, but we wanted to know what are the implications for the bond if we continue to think that everything is necessary as we have so far? Uh, Ms. Wentz, do you want to handle that? <laughs> I'll, I will handle that by saying we haven't calculated that yet as we're still in the needs assessment phase. And once we have all the needs identified and we meet with this group um, at the next meeting, we'll be able to fully answer that question. Let me, Michelle, just real quick, because that, that may be on a lot of people's minds about if we keep saying yes to everything or everything is a priority one, at some point there, there's a price tag on this. Uh, I want to reiterate something and just remind everyone that part of this part of this process is to not think about the money this second. I mean, I don't want to be naive and, and we're not naive and say we don't ever think about money, but Right now, we're we're trying to get everything on the table that is of that is of uh, of importance based on what our administration has shared with you, as well as what you as a community member or as a parent uh, feel. So uh, there is a strategy to begin culling this down. Uh, I've never been a part of a bond process that didn't. At the end of the day, everybody wanted any, everything, and the and the price tag was was at a certain price point that we said, okay, we've got to cut this down a little bit. And that's where Michelle earns her earns her keep is when she starts working to to find consensus and to find you know where is it we can all agree upon that we all support. So right now that's a fair question. I know it's probably on a lot of people's minds, but to the extent you can, don't don't let that drive your your thinking right now and your decision making. There's a process to address that as we move through this. But yes, completely <clears throat> understand why it's asked right now. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chambers, and and uh, that all that always comes up, and that's part of the uh, reason that we leave the uh, financial piece off until next meeting is just what Mr. Chambers said. We want you to to consider the the needs of the kids before we start applying uh, parameters to what we can afford, and Ms. Wentz will take care of that for us next. Uh, next meeting. Uh, Shannon's group number three, who's your spokesperson? And facilitators, if you will, please assign a spokesperson because we really need to hear from this committee. Uh, Shannon, who's yours? Yes, Aaron Burgess is going to be our spokesperson again. Okay, Mr. Burgess. Yes, uh, so a lot of our conversation focused around the press box and the voice amplification system that they had in, in the classrooms. So at, um, at 16.5 million for those voice amplification systems, we wanted to know if there was a scientific study that backed the necessity of those and, and, and you know, kind of uh, let us know, you know, how, how necessary that is and, and how big of an impact it would have. Uh, and, and then also about the press box and how much money they, they managed to save by cutting that down and, and how they got that. That's a great question. I'll let, uh, I'll let, Pam deal with the first part of it, and then we'll go to either Steve or Glenn for the second one. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the study, um, I'd have to go back to the literature um, from the Lightspeed uh, Technology Company, um, but it talked about um, that 75% of the school day students are actively taking in information from um, their surrounding. Um, and again, the younger students, uh, 90 to 100% of the information is carried uh, through the spoken word uh, for meaning. Um, but I can definitely get more information about um, the specific studies and have that in a follow-up, uh, the Q&A. Maybe you can do that uh, as part of your review at the next meeting. Would that Sounds be okay? Good. Absolutely. Mr. Burgess, is that all right if we delay that answer until next time? Okay, then let's hear from uh, either Steve or um, Jeff or Glenn about the press box scope of work. 
on the on the crump press box if you recall the first one was a two-story it was basically taking the existing press box removing it and adding a two-story structure that was significantly larger than what we currently have and proposing at this current stage so that cost to do all that work was 17 million dollars versus uh taking what we currently have bumping it out a little bit further in other words we're going to lose if we go with this plan we would lose roughly three rows of the top seats up at the very top of the stadium to allow for that little bit of expansion and then um, do the interior so you're saving a vast majority of not removing the existing structure and then you're doing a uh, uh, an elevator tower on the back side. Mr. Burgess, did you have a thought? Did you, was that answer satisfactory for you? Uh, so, so what are we still getting then? Uh, if not the, uh, I know it's the three rows obviously were taken out. Um, well, what you're getting is you're taking the interior space and completing complete gutting of that uh, antiquated area and then you're adding uh, a multimedia center the area for the CTE students more space for the coaching more space for uh, uh, visitors more area for our board and it's much more appealing uh, area than what we currently have and also it brings it up to ADA standards because currently uh, on the steps going up there, it doesn't meet ADA requirements as written in today's rules. Okay, thank you. Is that okay, Mr. Burgess? Everything okay? It still, still includes the um, the scoreboard, the video scoreboard too, that the CTE students would operate. That was a concern, I think, that we maintain that that new capability, right? That is correct. Right. It, and it does it does maintain that capability, but that scoreboard, as Michelle had mentioned earlier, is not a part of that same cost. That's a separate line item. Yeah. But maintain that multimedia opportunity for the students. Okay, Marla, uh, breakout rate or work rate number four. Who's your spokesperson? Yes, I'm gonna, it was um Mr. Bent's question. So I'm going to have him, his question was regarding um, fees and some of the uh, costs and how those costs were um, calculated. Is he Mr. on here now, Mr. Bantz? Yes, I am. Okay, Mr. Yeah. okay. So, yeah, and, um, and I, know, I know Mr. Chambers said we shouldn't worry about numbers just yet, but um, I know Steve in his presentation did bring up about um, the, the, the numbers that were put forward for the, for the assessments that were done. And um, he did mention that it would include permits. Permits would have to be included as well as escalation and contingencies. But uh, I think he did mention fees, con consultancy fees. So I think that would be another add-on add to the overall budget for each one of those projects. Is that correct, Steve? Uh, that, is, that is correct, Chris. And the, uh, the fees, uh, the soft cost, I'm going to call them, those costs that are not part of the construction, but the permits, the fees, uh, different things of that nature, those are included in those costs, but those are in today's dollars. So the, the number that's not included in those costs are uh, uh, inflation. And if we want to put an overall contingency on the, on the project. And by contingency, I mean this, that when you are looking at a, uh, a lot of these you know, messy renovation type one-off projects, you do have, uh, uh, for instance, you may replace a chiller, but then you get out there and really dig into it and find out that that chiller has some deteriorated piping that goes a little further than you wanted it to and, and et cetera. So, so that is also a determination, but yes, Chris, the, uh, the, the fees, all the soft costs are included in those numbers but the inflation and if we decide to put a contingency is not included in that number. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Bant. Answer. Let's move to, uh, to number five, Jennifer, who's your spokesperson? 
Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Miss Spurlock to just do a little bit of a, a summary of what we talked about, if you don't mind, Miss Spurlock. Okay. I don't mind. We really didn't have any questions. Just really want to commend everybody for doing such a good job. Group two and group two, group two and group three basically addressed what we were, if we had any questions about, and it was about the sound amplification system and then the strategy for cutting down the cost. And so Dr. Chambers, you're talking to a lady that loves to shop, but only if it's on sale. So we're looking at you guys to make the best decisions to spend the money the right way after you give us the the okay to say yes and no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furlock. Okay, let's go to number six and that's uh, Pam. And that was our group um, and Ms. Gimby is gonna speak for us. Oh, thank I'm sorry, Nicole. That's okay. Oh uh, yes, so basically the question that we have uh, is call our attention if there is any kind of timeline or what is the timeline projected or if there is any at all, in all these renovations, uh, including perhaps the new construction, the pictures that practically, referring specifically, the pictures that show Mr. Steve Holloway, where it shows us how a classroom look in the back um, all in the 50s, 60s, versus what we are expecting to have. Is there any timeline that um, they have considered where we can say all of the schools are gonna be like this in, X amount of time, or depending, of course, I understand that there are many factors, but some kind of time light at all. Okay, uh, I think probably that's a question for um, Steve. Would you? Are... I'm going to defer that a little bit. If I if I can repeat the question from what I think you I heard you say is that, it, as we mentioned in the presentation, uh, we're looking for. Uh, the committee to take a, a really good look at the district and see what is the future of the district? What is the forward thinking of the district? And what I heard you say is we have a, a couple of facilities uh, on the table right now, Ewan's and Chambers. Ewan's a major overhaul and renovation and addition. Chambers a replacement school. But I think what I heard you say is how long would it take to go across the remainder of the district to bring the remainder of the schools up to that standard that new standard that you as a committee would be generating now with this decision to move forward. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna defer that to the district on uh, kind of some future forward thinking on that. Let me, let me <clears throat> real quickly um, address that. The, I guess the, the short answer to that question is it, we, we will be hoping that a, a byproduct of this discussion ongoing with this committee would begin helping us formulate a timeline for other facilities. Obviously we can't, we can't uh, identify uh, every school in this district and, and, and realistically expect to provide this type of renovation uh, over a five or six year period of time like we would be with a couple of, a couple of these now. So it's gonna take, it's gonna take a process. It's gonna take time and as you, not only, I mean, one factor we look at is age of the building, but we also have to look at other factors. There's other structural issues. You may have an older building that's structurally sound and a much younger building that has foundation problems or structural issues. Um, uh, so there's, there's so many factors. So it's hard to say, uh, Ms. Gimby, how long it's gonna take but I think it's, I don't think it's unreasonable to say it's going to take probably three or four bond referendum processes to ultimately get to the schools. If we sat here today and says, you know, these, and I'm making this number up, but if these 14 schools at some point need to be replaced over the next 20, 30 years, uh, it'll take a good 15 or 20 years worth of bond, bond referendums, uh, to, to, to address all of them. So, um, without putting a true timeline and a true calendar in front of you and saying, and, and you know, in 2021, we're doing this and 2026, we're doing this and 2030, we're doing that. It's, it's, it's difficult, but I do think it's fair to say it's gonna take a couple of decades to get through the entire district uh, just because of, of, of cost factors. And I will, <laughs> Chris, I will address that, 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 it, that there is some cost factors in that. Um, and, and, and the ability and the availability of of uh, 
of contractors and others that could actually perform the work. If, if you approved them all tonight, if y'all did it, if we did every school right now, it'd be hard to do uh, because of just the availability of people to actually do the work. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Carla, can we move to uh, work group number seven? Yes, we can. Table seven spokesperson for tonight is Ms. Laura Negri. Hi, uh, so we talked about a couple of things, but one is the um, audio system in the classroom, the audio ampl amplification systems. And um, I thought it sounded like something that would help uh, bring equity to, to, you know, so all the kids in the room can hear the same. But we had a question about whether it's necessary in all the classrooms the same way. Uh, our, our room's going to be kind of analyzed to see, you know, some of them might have dead spots. Some of them, I, uh, I think some of the classrooms are still open concepts. So are, um, are they needed in all the classrooms uniformly in the same place, same position, or there's some sort of plan to kind of analyze what's needed where? That's a great question. Go, Pam. That I'm was sorry, Michelle. <laughs> it's okay. serious. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Currently, we actually have several systems that we're testing out across the entire district to um, get to the root of that very question. Uh, we're testing out in high schools, um, in our intermediate schools, elementary, as well as middle. Um, and I, maybe I didn't do uh, a good enough job explaining um, that the teachers wear a microphone and the microphone is not only tapped into the speaker that's in the classroom, but it's also tapped into the, uh, the multimedia on the computer. So our students that are learning at home also hear crystal clear sound. So um, there are many, many studies that talk about um, the amount of interference in a classroom just by classroom noise and teachers have to raise their voice in order to be heard and through this amplification system they speak at a normal tone and their voice is uh, those those subtle sounds are projected through the system so from an equity perspective um, it would definitely level the playing field uh, for all students and even students with uh, disabilities that may have uh, a hearing system that they wear, that system would plug into the back of the sound amplification system. Thank you, Pam. Did that answer the question? Okay, let's move to work group number eight. Nikki, who's your spokesperson? For the great debaters, we have Mr. Dave. Thank you, Nikki. The great debaters are uh, had a lot of discussion. Yeah, we need some pom poms. <laughs> um, we have a question for Pam, and it has to do with uh, classroom innovation. Uh, we were confused as to whether we wanted those boards to be in every classroom in the district or only the elementary schools. That's a great question. It's every classroom in the district. Okay, so our discussion was centered around that because we thought it would be uh, very, very good to have it be every classroom in the district. So thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. Were there any other questions, Dave, from uh, your work group or was that the main one that you all? Uh, we, we didn't really have a question. We had a comment and it was pretty universal that- uh, Let's hear it a great job with the uh, the Ag Center and it being such a, uh, a, a disgrace, such an embarrassment that we thought that that shouldn't be a priority too. It should be moved up to a priority one. Well, I, I, I don't think we have nine groups, do we, Kim? We just have eight, right? We have nine. We have nine. Who's, yeah. who's number nine? So I was facilitator, Tangela Hughes-Beston. Okay, Tangela, I'm sorry. For group nine. And we have Ms. Marva Watson, who will be our spokesperson. Ms. Marva was luckily, lucky enough to have Glenn and Jeff join in to answer her question. She had a question about replacing of the two campuses, about time frames, and, and I'll let her share her question. And um, Glenn and Jeff, if they want to kind of add in time in, we can go from there that we have, the whole group can hear what her question was. Oh, great. Great. Okay, let's hear it. 
Okay, my question was, why can't we uh, build a new campus for you and since you is over 50 years old? That was my question. And the gentleman told me that because of the history of UN, they felt renovation would be the key for UNs. Steve, were you the one that, who went to that group to answer that question? Both Jeff and Glenn. Okay, let's hear from both of them. Uh, part yeah, of I had to, oh, go ahead, Jeff. I, I was just gonna say, again, there's still a lot of unknowns in, in this discussion about these schools and exactly how the final form would be. One of the discussions about Ewan's is it would be very difficult <clears throat> to tear it down and build a new school. That opens up uh, a whole other can of worms in terms of what do you do with those kids for that year and a half. And, and Steve had mentioned that you know perhaps it was feasible. He had been involved in projects where ongoing operations could continue at the school and the remodel would be done in phases and so forth. And so that was part of why the discussion, early discussion has been, you know, ways of not just tearing it down and starting for over. Ultimately, when the research is all done, the answer may be that is the best solution and we'll figure out how to solve the other problems. Is that, Glenn, you want to add to that? No, I mean, you're correct, Jeff. And even, let's say the, like Jeff said, let's say after all the analysis and everything, all the experts come back and say, hey, you're better off tearing it down and re you know building in essence a new school the thought is even if that is the case that somehow some way we are going to save parts of history of Ewan's to incorporate it in a new building so that way it's all not lost of you know Houston has a bad reputation of tearing down history and just for the sake of building new and we don't necessarily want to do that in a leaf especially to one of our oldest elementary schools in in the district well it's the the first school that's still remaining and it's right in the heart of old a leaf so we we felt like the community would want some recollection of you know something that's sympathetic to the old school in some way or the other. Again, yeah, that we, specifically talked, designed. Yeah, we talked about um, how uh, incredible the building still is and the, the tile that is in the walls that is unique to uh, UNs. I mean, you, you can't find that anywhere. And so the thought was to, you know, if there was a way to salvage some of that as we build, a, you know, if, we, if that was the option to rebuild, and salvage some of that tile or that terrazzo, uh, and as you and put it in maybe some hallways or in the, in the entrance, and that would be a dedication uh, to the history of Ewan's and where and where it came from. So those are some ideas that we talked about as how to salvage the historical uh, value that that building has, and some of the unique pieces that are in that building. You, you just can't you can't find that anywhere else. And you won't find it in, in any new building. So. Okay, it does, uh, I, can, I have like two or three minutes. If somebody has a burning question that they'd like to ask, I can entertain that right now. Uh, I think there was a question that came to my phone uh, about carpets. And I, I, uh, Jeff, do you want to, I think it came from Julie's group or about why, why, or why do we use carpets? Jeff, do you mind answering that, please? No, certainly. Uh, soft flooring carpeting has been the preferred uh, material to use for floor surfaces in, in not just a leaf, but in many, many, many school districts. A lot of that has to do with the, the comfort level of it, the, the quietness that it provides. You know, it, it helps classrooms cut down on noise and so forth. You know, from a learning environment, those are some of the reasons. From a from a practical environment, it takes far less to maintain uh, soft surface than it does hard surfaces in terms of the amount of time and that is spent on it. Um, it also is one of the longest lasting materials. Again, it, if properly maintained, which we do, 
you know, we replace our carpet every 22 years. And, and we've got schools that when it got to be 22 years, we said, man, we can't tear this out. It still looks good. And, you know, we, we got a carpet job we did a few years ago. It went 25 years. And finally we said, well, we promised the community we were going to replace it. So we need to replace it, even though it still looks and performs great. So <clears throat> the, there are new materials out in the market that have come out in the past 10 or 15 years. We are using some of those in certain places. Um, time will tell how well they hold up and, and perform. Uh, but anyway, that's that's our primary reason for carpeting. We uh, we do use a lot of it, and we have been pleased with the way it performs, and we take good care of it. And Jeff, I might add to that also that the carpets that we use in the commercial uh, school buildings, <clears throat> they are a solid vinyl back, and it's a vinyl product on that uh, on the loop pile of that carpet itself. So so it's it's not like a carpet in your house or, or carpets at other places. So uh, the district is able to go in there with some real heavy duty extraction machines and thoroughly clean that carpet, but it does have a, uh, it's probably about an eighth of an inch thick vinyl, solid vinyl back on the back of that carpet. Thanks. In addition, in, in addition, we also use a roll good versus a carpet tile that you see a lot of high ed use. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, Steve, because the flooring carpeting we use is is basically waterproof. If if something kids spill something on it, we're able to come and, and get that out because it never goes beneath that pad. And the, even the seams of the carpet are welded, uh, chemically welded. The the, the the nylon yarn is melted together, and so these carpets um, just hold up better in terms of not letting you know anything get beneath them that could cause odors or mold or anything like that. So that's great points, Steve. Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll stop with our questions. I'll remind you that if you have an additional questions from the group and they're sent to uh, Craig, we will um, make sure that those are answered on the district website, the bond steering committee tab. You all are just absolute warriors. I keep looking at the participants list to see if we've lost anybody and you stick it out. And I really appreciate uh, this committee for that. You're very consistent in your attendance and you're very engaged with your groups. So at our next meeting, which is on, April, on um, May 13th, uh, we're gonna have some good news and some bad news for you. The good news is that if, I've, if I'm interpreting a lot of your comments, you want it all. Uh, but the bad news is that Ms. Wentz is going to bring us the news about what we can actually afford. So that may create some angst in our committee when we realize that we're going to have to make some choices. Uh, Ms. Wentz is our Assistant Superintendent of, of Finance, and she's going to talk to us about the various scenarios or the impact of uh, different amounts of a bond on our taxes. Uh, you won't want to miss that meeting. That's the first time that you'll uh, be hearing about the financial piece of the, all of the work that you're doing. So then at the June 10th meeting, uh, we will actually make our decisions. The bulk of the next meeting is going to be spent in your work groups for you to, to look at the whole thing, all of the projects and to start uh, qualifying your, uh, your wants and the things that you feel are the, for the best for ALEF ISD. You've been very, very great. I really appreciate it. Hilda, uh, Ms. Rodriguez is the uh, district co-chair with Mr. Ryland. Would you like to say anything to the committee to close us out? You know, you know, Michelle, you just, you just said it all. I mean, I, I went into uh, one of the groups and the, the, this great discussion and questions um, in regards to the press box and, and then other questions about the carpet. And so they're, y'all are really putting in some really good thinking and, and, uh, and input. And, and, and then we're gonna have to make some big decisions in the next couple of meetings. So uh, continue to come uh, and uh, continue to put your input because yes, you, you are deciding factors in, in, the, in, the, in the entire bond package. Uh, when we present it to the board. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Ed if he wants to end it for us, please. 
No, I'll just say, you know, what a great group, man. What a great group to be a part of. You guys were today, this evening, man, you were focused. Uh, you were uh, diversified in your thoughts. You had uh, very engaging questions. And so it's just really a pleasure to be a part of this group. So thank you guys for your participation, your commitment, your passion, uh, and your focus on getting this job done. So have a great evening, everybody.